We're going to see the tears of the prophet combined with God's own tears. The text intermingles the mosaic of these three hearts. The people have chased after another groom, forgetting their majestic life-giving bride, their life-giving groom. Then God weeps over the life of his bride while wooing her with grace. It says, come back to me before I discipline you. The prophet stands in the between these two now. His heart is welded to God's heart, crying over what God cries over and lamenting that his fellow people, his fellow women, the, the children refuse to listen to him. One author writes that Jeremiah weeps not just because of the calamity coming upon the people, but mainly because of their blindness. They seem oblivious to that their sin and yet attempt to lay the blame back on God. In Jeremiah 8, 18, Jeremiah says, My joy is gone. Grief is upon me. My heart is sick within me. The prophet cries. The people cry in Jeremiah 8, 19, Is the Lord not in Zion? Is the king not in her? They're like, hey, isn't our God king? What in the world will ever happen to us? And Jeremiah continues to cry in verse 21 of chapter 8, For the wound of the daughter of my people is my heart wounded. And in verse 22, Jeremiah is basically saying, Why aren't the people changing? Can't they hear? Can't they comprehend? The tears of God and his people and the prophet remind us also of Jesus' own tears in Luke 19. And when Jesus drew, drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would you, even you, had known on this day that the things make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Even Jesus wept for his people at the time when he was there. So that God's tears is not a new thing. So as we go into chapter, ch chapter 9, let's look at God's tears. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes were fountained of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the desert a traveler's lodging place, that I might leave my people and go away from them, for they're all adulterers, a company of treacherous men. They bend their tongue like a bow. Falsehood and not truth has grown strong in the land, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they don't know me, declares the Lord. Look at verse 1. Oh, that my head were waters. Oh, that my head were waters, my eyes a fountain of tears, that I may weep day and night for the slain of my daughter, of my people. Can you, the imagery of the fountain. Whose voice is this? Is it Jeremiah or God's? There is a ton of scholarly research and ink and spilt on what? Is this Jeremiah's voice or is this God's voice? I think it's incredibly cool that it proves the principle that Jeremiah's heart is so welded to the Lord's that when he writes this, you can't tell who's talking. Does it make a difference whose voice it really is? Jeremiah is speaking for God. God has said, Jeremiah, I'm going to give you the words to say. Do we cry over what God cries over? Would our hearts be so welded to God's desires that when our tears are, are falling for what God would cry over? Do our passions, that which our mind dwells upon, that which evicts, evokes strong emotion, would it be the same for what God's emotions are? But even if this is definitively God's voice, look at his heart his passion, his character, his real life on life, life on time with somebody, there's true care for his beloved, his people. And what are the people like? Look at verse 3. Their tongues are bent bows, ready to launch acidic arrows. If you've ever been into archery, the power of a bow and the power of an arrow is still today a mighty weapon. And their tongues are the bow. Their words are the acidic arrows. And they built a foundation upon mistrust, lies, and oppression. Why? 
Verse 6, all because they refuse to know me, declares the Lord. If you know God this morning, is your tongue a bow that stretches back and is strung to be able to release words that hurt? Words that are malicious. Words that you can, you can say, maybe I could have couched that better. I could have chose my setting better and communicated to the one I love in a way in which they could receive it well. Or do I just spring it back, launch that arrow, and wherever it lands, it lands. Notice the writer of Jeremiah from his heart considers following God, knowing God is right in connection with your tongue. Sounds like James. James. These ideas stretch clear through Scripture. But God's divine heart also ensures His justice. Look at verse 9. Shall I not punish them for these things, declares the Lord? And shall I not avenge myself on a nation such as this? I will take up the wheeling and wailing for the mountains and I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins. How seriously does God take knowing Him with the words that you choose, being in your community, being on your mean streets, and what does your life of faith look like when it's in action and it's coming out your mouth? And in God's grace, move with me to chapter 9, verse 12. Who is the man so wise that he can understand this? To whom has the mouth of the Lord spoken that he may declare it? Why is the land ruined and laid waste like a wilderness and no one passes through? And the Lord says, because they have forsaken my law that I set before them and have not obeyed my voice or walked in accord with it, but have stubbornly followed their own hearts and gone after Baals as their fathers taught them. God answers the why of his judgment coming right here. Why the land? Everybody look up for a second. We're getting ready to go into some really thick sections of Scripture. I'm going to explain some very complicated but very fundamental ideas clear through Scripture. So why is the land come up as being ruined in the text before people ever are? The land is literally promised to the people by God's promise to Abraham and to Moses. So his judgment first, he says, I'm going to do something to your land. This is Genesis 15, Leviticus 26, and Deuteronomy 29. Don't miss that. There's a literal promise for a literal people for a literal land. You will not hear that taught in every church in the United States this morning. There's a literal promise to a literal people for a literal land. And God starts out with his judgment, I'll take the land from you. But you ask me why? He, he, he promised Abraham unconditionally. Absolutely. And he promised Moses, here's how you will go into the land, and here's how you will stay in the land. You give one of your keys a car, you give your ki kids a car. Here, it's all yours as long as you make the payments, pay your insurance, get a job. Same thing with Moses. Abraham, here's your land. All right, it's going to come about. Moses, here's how then you stay in it. Here's how you keep the title. So God starts off with the rhetorical questions. Hey, who, have you listening this morning, who's wise enough to understand what I'm about ready to tell you? We're going to answer those questions. So he starts off, why is the land ruined and the land laid waste like a wilderness? Because I'm going to judge you. You have not kept my word. Why will the people be disciplined? What's the purpose of the law? Probably the hardest question you'll answer in a long time. It's one of the most complex questions ever to go through and study about the Bible. What's the purpose of the law? I know there's one man who told me that, hey, I teach in my church that the purpose of the law is only to prove that people are sinful. It's not true. The law illustrates God's grace. The law is there, and we'll see God has requirements for having a relationship with Him. If the purpose of the law is to only prove that you're horrible and you're sinful, then why could God judge you for not keeping it? 
ask yourself that question before we go any farther. If the purpose of the law is only to prove that you're sinful and you cannot have a relationship with God, then how would he ever judge you? Would you ever assign your children or somebody underneath you a task and say, do this, and if you don't, I'll judge you, knowing all full and well that they never could? That is a masochistic God that is being taught the nation over that the law is only there to prove that you're bad, that you need help. The law is there for a bigger reason to illustrate God's grace. If you could never keep it, if God knew from the get-go that the people of Israel and the people of Judah could never, ever keep his law, would he have any basis in Jeremiah 9 to judge them for not keeping it? Makes sense, doesn't it? Are you tracking with me? Because now we're going to go even further. Because of the covenant that God made, with Abraham, and it's built upon because of Moses, they agree to abide by the law. The law says, hey, I brought you out of Egypt. We're at the base of Mount Sinai. You're now my people. Here's how you have a relationship with me, and here's how you have a relationship with each other. They agree to abide by it. Here's how you act. Here's how you interact. Here's how you show love. Here's how you treat one another. Here how you're going to illustrate to the world around you that you have a relationship with me. Here's how your sin is taken care of. Isn't that one of our greatest questions? How do I take care of my sin in relationship to God? He says, here's how you do this. The law could be done. Everybody turn their Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 30. This will be on page 138 in the story Bible. Story Bible. If you're ever taught that the law was impossible for people to do, impossible for them to complete, Impossible for them to have a right relationship with God. Please go to Deuteronomy 30. When the individual told me that this is how he teaches in his church, I turned to this passage and he goes, I never knew that. Please do not leave this morning without knowing Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14. Are we there? Not a heads. Starting in verse 11. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you. Neither it is far off. It is not in heaven that you, you should say, who will send to heaven for us and bring it down to us that we may hear it and do it? Neither it is beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear and do it? But the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. For this is the commandment I command you today. It's not too hard for you. It's not too far off. You can keep the law. God the Father is going to discipline his children based upon a criteria in which they could keep. Are we on the same page? This might be new information for a lot of you. The law is the means of God illustrating his grace. God literally says in Leviticus 26 over and over, walk with me, I will walk with you. And not only bigger than that, I will dwell with you. My presence will be with you. But walk with me. Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 10. Walk with me. Be with me. I will be with you. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear your God to walk in His ways, to love Him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul. The law is the standard by which God could literally say, walk contrary to me. That's in the text. Here's how you walk with me, and I walk with you. Walk contrary to me, and I will walk contrary to you. Leviticus 26, 13 through 46. God wants to walk and be with his people. 
It's no wonder that the imagery that we got from Ephesians has it over and over again. What word? We read it this morning. Walk. A Jew who comes to know Jesus writes the church in Ephesus. And what language does he use when it means to come to know Jesus? Because we have Ephesians 1 and 2. How do you get to know God? Faith through grace. Then, the last half of the book is all this walking imagery. Walking. What's it look like in the home? What's it look like in the workplace? What's it look like here? Walking, walking, walking. Do you see where they're connected? God wants to walk with his people, Israel. Jesus wants to walk with his church. The idea goes clear through. That is God's grace. I want to walk with you, and here's how. Here's what it means to have a relationship. Here's what it means to deal with sin. Does any of this sound familiar to what you've been taught of having a relationship with Jesus today? It has not changed except the object of faith. The object of faith. Look, faith is believing what God says is true. Just have, you, if God says it, that's true. God says, do this, they did it. Abraham, you do this. Okay, you believe it's true, Abraham, I'm going to give you a kid. Yes. So with believing God and believing what God said is true was attributed to Abraham as faith. Faith. There is a sac bloody sacrifice for your sins. Leviticus 4, Numbers 29. For a priest, if you have sinned, Bring me a bull without blemish. For the entire people, there was a category. If the entire congregation is sin as a group, bring me a bull without blemish. For the leader, if you're a leader of a group of people, bring me a male goat or a buck. This is a sacrifice for your sin. Person, if you have sinned, take care of your sin. Bring me a lamb without blemish. We were going to kill it. It's going to be a sacrifice for your sin. What if a person says, you know, they come to the priest and they say, I, I really like my lamb. I want to bring a bunny. Why, why does it have to be a lamb? Because God said so. He set up the rules and he said, if you want to have a relationship and deal with sin, this is what you need to bring to me. So faith is when you put your hand on that lamb and said, through the sacrifice of this lamb, my sins are taken care of. For a priest had put his hand on the bull, and it was killed. Through this sacrifice, my sins are forgiven. For us, faith, believing what God says is true. Who's our sacrifice? Jesus. What's the difference between Jesus and a bull? Jesus happens to be God. But listen to me. God says, through this death, you will have a relationship with me, just like through this bull. The difference with Jesus is, it was a one-time sacrifice for everything. You don't have to worry about if it's a leader, if it's a priest, if it's a person. It's the same sacrifice. The curse of the law is this. You had to do it over and over every year. The bull only covered sin for the duration in which until you did it again. Jesus' one-time sacrifice in Romans 4 and in Hebrews 10 says he paid it all. He was the one-time sacrifice for sin. He was literally sacrificed for you. Have faith in that. God says through this sacrifice you can have a relationship with me. Does it make any sense to you now how the Old Testament law of atonement looks like the New Testament law of atonement. Through the sacrifice of this, believing that this is true, your sins are forgiven. You now understand atonement law. That's why Jesus had to die. God has always required a blood sacrifice for sin. God has said, here's how you come to know me. Here's how we have a relationship. Here's how you interact with one another. Here's how you deal with sin. All the way from Genesis to Revelation. 
That's the purpose of the law. I do all of this to illustrate that if God's going to judge his people for not keeping the law, how could he do it if they couldn't keep it? God's grace says, if you have a sin issue, here's the way of reconciling with me. It's no different today. If somebody has a sin issue and they want to re restore their relationship with God, how do they do that? How do we communicate that to our people on our mean streets? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. The resurrection is God's proof that he said, hey, it's payment in full. But the good news is that through Jesus, we can have a relationship with God. What does God delight in? We've seen that God's tears, God's law, which is his grace. And what does God delight in? Move with me to Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast at this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. To know and understand the Lord. Here's the law. Here's how you have a relationship with me. Now God says, I want you to know me. I want you to understand me. How do we learn of God's steadfast love? His love that keeps his covenant relationship without fail. Where do we learn about his love? In Jeremiah, if they were to come to Jeremiah and say, Jeremiah, we want to learn about God's steadfast love, where do we go? Leviticus and Deuteronomy. I've kept my relationship with you in spite of everything you've done. Justice. Judgment that is pure, unbiased, and perfect, and always conforms to his character. Judgment that is pure, unbiased, and perfect, which always conforms to his character. God not only loves us, he has a perfect justice and righteousness. He always will adhere to his perfect standard. Can you have love without judgment? Because God said, I loved you so much that I sent my son, but he really doesn't have to die. No, he's always been just. There will be blood for that sacrifice. The look of love when God sent his son to die for us looked like his own son himself taking and dying for you to fulfill his requirements for justice and righteousness. Perfect adherence to his perfect standard. In these things God delights. This is where God takes his highest pleasure and satisfaction. Know him, understand him, and do it. Faith in action. Faith without works is what? Dead. So I'm a, I'm, I'm a Jew, and I come to the temple, and I say, well, I want to take care of sin. I'm going to give me a lamb. Okay, they did the lamb. I'm good to go. I can do what I want to do. No. If you're knowing the Lord your God and you're chasing after him and delighting what he wants in, you're going to love like he does and trust in his judgment and relish in his righteousness for which he's given to us because of what Jesus did. Look at verse 24. Let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. Let him who boasts, boasts in this, that he understands and knows me. What do we get to brag about? What do we get to boast about? We hear it a lot. People say, well, I'm a horrible sinner, and I just, you know, it's just so good that God loves me. Or can you boast it? I know God. I delight in what he delights in. I boast that I'm getting to know him and understand him, and that's working itself out of my feet and hands into my community, into my mean streets. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 31. But God chose what was foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what was low and despised in the world, even though things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human might boast in the presence of God. But look at verse 30. And because of him, because of God the Father, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom and from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Verse 31, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. 
Same ideas. 1 Corinthians 131, Jeremiah 9. Both people boast in that, that you know, understand, and follow the Lord. That's what God delights in. And in chapter 10 of Jeremiah, God's going to fight the other gods. We love it when our hero takes on other bad guys, don't we? So God's going to take on the other gods. Move to Jeremiah chapter 10. Verse 1. Hear the word that the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord. Learn not the ways of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are di dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked by an axe by the hands of a craftsman. They decorate it with silver and gold, and they fasten it with a hammer and nail so it can't move. Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field. You get this picture. God says, hey, don't, don't pay attention to these people. This is what they do. They go into the woods, get their axe out, get their chainsaw, fire it up, cut it up, take it home, put it on the planer, polish it, put it together, cover it in gold and silver, then they worship it. Literally, this is absurd, God says. This is futile. This is insubstantial. <coughs> insubstantial. But this is what the people are worshiping. Do we do that? Well, listen. We like to get up in the morning, go to work, fashion something with our hands or with our minds, and decorate it with accolades and seniority. We then get to buy things and get to yell to our community, look what I did, look what I did. Look at my toy. Look what I got. I did that. Anything that becomes more important to, than God becomes our idol. We worship idols all the time. We say, hey, I'll go and make something with my hands, whether I do it with my mind or literally with my hands and build something. I attained my degree. I now have this position in society. People now respect me. Look what I did. Look how good my bank account looks. Or on the other hand, we could say, hey, God, I'm really upset because I don't have a lot of money at home. You're not really going to take care of me because I don't have all these things. We make an idol out of not having money, so we, then we like, oh, it's so stressful. God, how are you going to take care of me now? So on either end, even we're making a ton of cool things. We've got a ton of toys that everybody can come over and see. Because the license plate that says, or the bumper sticker that says, he with the most toys wins. Okay, but on the other side, hey, I'm so stressed out. We're in between bills. I don't have enough money. And it's taking over my world, the fact that I don't have enough money to get around, are both saying that God can't, doesn't have control of your circumstances. We are idol factories makers like crazy. And God says these are all vanity. That's absurd. That's futile. Because God wants to declare who he is. Look at verse 6. Jeremiah says, There's none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. Stop there. Your name, just your name. If we were to take everybody's name that's in here this morning, <coughs> take it downtown and just put it up on a great big billboard. When anybody in society say, Woo, they're here. Is your reputation big enough that just putting your name up on a billboard, people would respect that? Just the name of God alone, his reputation is so great. His reputation, his character, just saying his name. By the way, in Philippians 2.10, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Not after they've deliberated their sin. Not after he shows up and gets a great discourse on why he was the Messiah and returning king. No, just when they announce his name. Satan, the demons, people, everybody bows. Just the name of God is enough to say, I'm not worshiping something other than God because of his reputation in his world that he created. Fear. The fear of God. 
the oh my goodness, there is a God who literally exists. The honor and terrifying reverence due to him just because of his majesty. Uh, for the believer, for the one who's following after Jesus, that's like, whoa, there's a God who's just by his knee, name, every knee will bow, and he loves me. He has invited me, and he has adopted me into, my, into his family. Wow, look what he can do. For those who reject Jesus, is like, whoa, there is a God who created, who can judge, and has divine right over everything. That's fear. Living. God actually lives. God actually exists. He exists even outside of time. And let me say this. You cannot categorize him into a cool little box that's all doctrine and theory. If you've got God figured out, whoa. If you're bored with discovering who he is and his character, then you have created a God box that is really small and you get, if anything that you deal with him fits into that box, you have boxed in just the name of God enough to say, I've got it figured out. He was never made, originated, or construed in somebody's head. God is living. We should fear him. He has name and his reputation and he's always true. The definition of exactly what is most essential. A direct representation of what is truly real. Our idols are just paper, fiberglass, carbon fiber, titles, seniority, bank accounts, status, knowledge, position, or office. Compared to God. Do any of what I just described make up with a reputation of just his name, the fear of who he is, the fact that he's living truth. Jeremiah 10, verse 11. So if God has this, this judgment with his people and he's saying, hey, you are worshiping other gods and I am supreme over everything. What about us, Jeremiah? Jeremiah says, what about us, God? What about me? I'm telling the people your word and I'm in a hard spot. This is where Jeremiah gets to be really, really true because this is where we've talked to all this cool theory. But now you're like, hey, Todd, I believe in what you're saying. Life has been really a struggle. <coughs> Where's God? Join me in chapter 10, verse 11. No, chapter 10, verse 23. I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself, that it is not in a man who, who walks to direct his steps. Correct me, O Lord, but in justice, not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. I know, Lord, that you are God, that if I was left unto myself, I would not make the right decisions. I would not chase after you. And I know that that's going to bring corrections, and I'm trusting you. You're going to diss me like a loving father. That's why we read Hebrews this morning. I want to chase after you. God, you rule. The only place I can turn is to you. Correct me in your justice. I submit to you. I submit to what, submit to what you say is true and I believe it. And I submit to what you will do for your justice in your time. And Jeremiah in chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, God comes back and reminds them one more time of the agreement that they broke with him. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, chapter 11, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Hear the words of this covenant. Speak to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You shall say to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, cursed be the man who does not hear the words of this co covenant that I commanded your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace saying, listen to my voice and do all that I command you. So shall you be my people and I will be your God that I may confirm the oath that I swore to your fathers to give them the land flowing with milk and honey as it is this day. Then I answered, so be it, Lord. God has made an agreement. Work with me here for a second. The book of Exodus starts off with what? There rose a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. 
The people are stuck in slavery. God shows up in a miraculous way, rescues his people, and takes them to where? The base of Mount Sinai. That's the book of Exodus. The end of Exodus, they build the tabernacle. Don't know what to do with it. What do we do with this? God says, here, I'm going to tell you what to do with it, and here's how you have a relationship with me. Therefore, you have the book of Leviticus. We're still at the base of Mount Sinai. Base of Mount Sinai, we're going to leave. We're going to go on a camping trip. We're going to go toward the promised land. That's the book of Numbers. How do they behave on the way to their camping trip? Horrible. When God says, go into the land, they're like, no, 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 there's giants there. We're going to get killed, and who's going to take care of our kids? God says, ah, I'll take care of your kids. In fact, your kids will be the ones that go into the promised land. Since you disobey me, y'all are going to die. So there's this very short trip, like here to Bellevue kind of thing, maybe a little lower. And it takes them 40 years, or maybe Willis. Then. Yeah, Willis. So they're 40 years. Book of Numbers. So drop dead first generation. Second generation comes up. And Moses says, hey, you're all going to go into the promised land. But first, that God made this agreement at Sinai. And we're going to repeat it. You all get it. And I want you to all say we're going to do this. Because your parents did, and you all know that. Book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Law second time. Why the law second time? Y'all heard it the first time. First family died off. Second generation is going to go in the promised land. The book of the law, Leviticus and Deuteronomy. How do you have a relationship with God? So they go into the land. Joshua takes them in. They, so they take the land, right? Then we fast forward. They want a king. So they get a king. So they rule. So we got these kings, right? And they do pretty good. You get to Solomon. It's great. Then Solomon's kingdom splits. The kings go like this, right? Crash and burn. Now we're at Jeremiah. I am covering territory like at 35,000 feet, but I'm trying to give you the big picture. Crash and burn. Y'all didn't get it. I said law to you twice. How do you have a relationship? How do you walk with me? I gave you a ton of time because these kings crashed and burned. Jeremiah comes along and says, hey, God said you're going to be judged because you did not follow the law. That's what we just read. You did not keep my covenant. You did not keep my agreement. Can they keep the agreement? Yes. Believe and follow what God says is true. People, Jeremiah says, just believe it, follow it, and submit to it. Put your faith in action. You can repent. That's why we read Jeremiah chapter 7, because God defines to the people what de repentance looks like. Know me, follow me, and treat others like you know and follow me. Put your faith into action. The agreement that God made. God says, look, 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 right there. Um, move your finger. Verse... Uh, 4 and chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 4. That I commanded your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. What did he command their fathers when they brought them out of the land of Egypt? What is that? What did they get at the bottom of Mesa? Where are they? When they brought them out of Egypt, book of Exodus, where are they? Mountain. Mount Sinai. What did, he, what did Moses bring down off the top of Mount Sinai? The commandments, the law. How do you have a relationship with me, God says, and how do you have a relationship with others? You all didn't follow that. That's what he's saying. When I brought your family out and I brought you to this base, when I brought you out of Egypt, that fiery furnace, y'all remember? Okay? So there's Moses. The covenant. That I might confirm the oath that I swore to your fathers to give them a lamb flowing with milk and honey. Where did God make this promise about a land first? To Abraham, Genesis 15. God said, hey, I made these two agreements with y'all, and you haven't kept them. How? It's a really, 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 really long time between Abraham and Moses and Moses and Jeremiah. God's grace. The time between, hey, y'all, you're messing up, and I'm going to give you a whooping, to the time when he does give you the whooping is the grace. There is a long period of time between here's our agreement and here is when you all didn't keep it and I'm going to whoop you. So by the time you get to Jeremiah, you're like, why is God so mad? This is such a pessimistic book. Well, he's finally boiled over. Mom's going to whoop you. I've told you 453 times over 23 days. If you do that again, I'm going to whoop you. Here's the whooping. And here's the criteria for the whooping. You did not keep the laws and agreements that I gave you. Could they keep it? Yes. Verse 
Remember we talked about Jeremiah and his plight? So Jeremiah's given this information to them. He's seeing this coming, because remember when Jeremiah's telling everybody, it's kind of actually the good times, King Josiah. And he's like, okay, God, my heart's well to yours. I'm crying for what you're crying, and life is horrible. Jeremiah 11, verse 18. Listen to the words of Jeremiah as he cries to the God who can control his circumstances, who has love, justice, and righteousness for his servant. Listen to Jeremiah's word. Chapter 11, verse 18. The Lord made it known to me, and I knew. Then you showed me your deeds, but I was like a lamb, gentle lamb led to slaughter. I did not know it was against me they devised schemes saying, let us destroy the tree of, with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living that his name be remembered no more. What are they saying? Jeremiah's come to him and said, Lord, you're sending me like a lamb to the slaughter. They want to erase my name. Remember how good God's name was and how he was a mighty Lord of hosts and king of angels' armies? That was a great thing. When you lost your name, your heritage was a bad deal then. So they said, we're not only going to kill you, but we're going to kill everybody related to you. Your name will be forgotten. When, you read, when I read that, who did you think of? Like a gentle lamb led to slaughter. Jesus. Verse 20. But of God... But, O oh Lord of hosts, the king of angel army, the king who rules over every angel, who judges righteously, who tusks the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you have I committed my cause. What's, what's the response? What's Jeremiah's response to this? He works through it. You hear his heart. God, you're leading me like a lamb to the slaughter. But you got it. I commit my cause to you. And then God responds. In verse 21, Therefore the Lord says concerning the man of Anatoth, who seek your life, do not prof prophesy in the name of the Lord, or you will die by our hand. Therefore the Lord of hosts says, Behold, I will punish them. In there. By the way, do you remember Jeremiah, the name of Jeremiah's hometown? It's right here. What he's saying is, hey, God, these guys who are persecuting me, my fellow priests, and I grew up with them, and I was supposed to be a priest, want to kill me, erase my name. I dedicate all of what's going to happen to you to your cause. And God says, by the way, I'm going to kill them all. Your hometown, I will eradicate. I got this, but in my timing, they're dead. It'll be a lot of years before Jeremiah sees this, by the way. But don't miss who he's talking to. It's your high school graduation class. It's the guys you worked with for 40 years. It's every friend that you've had since college. These are you now your enemy. This is your hometown. Guys, I got it. I know. I know. I want to kill you. you. I know you feel like a lamb going to go into the slaughter. So as we go into our mean streets, look, we've seen God's tears. Oh, the people, my people. We've seen God's grace. Through whom? Jesus, how do you have a relationship with me? How do you have a relationship with others? And what does that look like in your community? That's all in God's grace. What is God's delight? His love, his justice, his righteousness. God versus other gods. How does that go? He wins. In God's agreement. What's the essence of God's agreement? Abraham, Moses, and with Jesus. What does he require of us? What word have we used over and over again? From Leviticus and Ephesians this morning. Walk. Walk with me. Walk with me. How do we walk? We walk into our seat, tr streets and we see that the streets are really, really wet because God's own tears. He's given a ton of grace and saying, here's how you have a relationship with me and you guys have refused this. But God is a God of justice. So as we go into our mean streets, take the word and even God wants to clean up the meanest ones but they're wet because of God's own tears. So as we sung this morning, will you go into the homes of the broken? Will you follow him? Will you walk with him? So as this week, one person, pray for one person 
that this week, God, who will it be that I will walk with you as I reach out to them in these wet streets that you've cried over? That's not just in the sermon with me. That sounded pretty good. There was some cool theology in there. Can you commit to praying for that? Because God loved you enough, loved me enough to do all of this. And he's crying over these streets and they're wet because of his tears. He's given us his word and he wants to clean the meanest ones. How will we then be his ambassadors to do that this week? I challenge it. Everybody, pray for one person. Share that information with this week in some way. And I look forward to next time we gather as a family during our fellowship time to come and say, here's how God answered that.